And my hope today is to get through the entire chapter of 27 and then venture into chapter 28 just a bit, maybe the first two verses. Uh, we're taking on an interesting passage today, and, and, um, and, and I'm, I, it is my prayer that the Lord would encourage you and challenge you, maybe correct you, uh, whatever it may be, we just pray that the Lord would do a wonderful work in your life. So let's, let's just pray about that and see what the Lord wants to do. Father, this is your word. And Lord, we all say together, the Christian church, as a community of Christians, community of like-minded believers, Lord, we say that we love your word and we're here to study your word. So I ask, Lord, by the power of your spirit, that you would give me clarity of speech, you would direct my thoughts, um, Lord, would you, would, would you show us the intent of your scriptures, and would you just do a good work among us right now, Lord? We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Consider this statement as we approach our passage of scripture. This statement really embodies the entire uh, message I'd like to share with you this morning. But oftentimes, it's not so much the pressure of a trial that's the difficulty, it's the fact that the trial seems to never end. My friends, isn't it true that when we face, what, you're going to hear me say this term a lot this morning, when we face extended trials, isn't it true that we can allow ourselves to easily be led to a place of despair and discouragement, to a place of doubt and unbelief? Oh, my friends, I have known so many people over the years, who have found themselves in the midst of an extended trial. And, 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 and they'll say to me, Pastor Nick, there's no hope. Pastor Nick, there's no, uh, for lack of a, a, a better phrase, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Pastor Nick, God has just given up on me. His promises, his plans, all of it. Where's God at in this? It seems like the trial will not end know so many people in that. And it's my hope that this morning that, you know, if you found, uh, if you found your place in an extended trial this morning, or you may be entering into one as a Christian, it's my hope that you find um, peace in the midst of that from, that pa from the passage that we're about to study. Now, as we approach our passage of study, just for a moment, I want you to put yourself in the scene. Just for a moment, I'd like for you to place yourself in David's position and try to understand all that he's been through up to this point in chapter 27. Listen, as a teenager and the youngest of eight siblings, you're out in the fields and you're te uh, uh, tending to your father's sheep. And then, and then suddenly one of your older brothers comes running there to you in the field. And, 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 and your older brother comes up to you and they say, they say David. Listen, uh, you know, you, you got to come with me now. The prophet Samuel is at our home, and the prophet Samuel wants to speak specifically to you. Well, you come to your home, you go inside, and the prophet Samuel, he takes one look at you and, and, and jumps to his feet. He takes out a flask of oil, and he begins taking that, that flask of oil, and he pours it on your head. The oil is running down your head, running all over your face. It's dripping onto your clothes and stuff. And you're wondering, what? what's going on? And the prophet Samuel leans in. He whispers into your ear, you have been chosen by God and anointed to be the next king of Israel. Well, before you know it, you're no longer tending sheep in your father's field. You've been hired to work in the royal palace under the first king of Israel, under King Saul. And your job in the royal palace is to play music for the king when he's in one of his uncontrolled rages. Well, shortly after this, you visit your brothers and the other Israelite soldiers. They've made their way out to the battleground and, 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 and they've set themselves in battle array against the, their, their, their greatest enemies, the, the Philistines. And so you go out there and while you're there, you notice that uh, you notice something a little off, something a little odd. 
And you notice that um, um, this giant Philistine warrior is taunting and defying the armies of Israel. And his name is Goliath, right? And, and you start asking a little bit of questions and you find out that this man, this giant has been doing this twice a day for 40 days. He's been coming out once in the morning, once in the evening, and he's been taunting the, uh, uh, the, the Israeli army and he's been defying the living God. And you start asking some questions. How come somebody, how come, you look around, how come nobody's dealt with this guy? How come nobody said something to him? How come nobody, nobody, nobody's done anything? And you look around and men are scared. They're terrified of this giant Goliath. And so, no one's going to face him. So you boldly say that you're going to go out. You go out and you face this giant Goliath. And with one stone thrown from your sling, you conquer the giant and, and, and deliver Israel from their enemies. And it's at this point, this victory sets you up for a lot of popularity, a lot of fame, uh, because you become now the, Israel's newest national hero. I mean, you are, you are popular, you're well-known, you're admired by the entire nation. And after this, after your defeat, or your victory rather, over the giant Goliath, King Saul decides, you know what, this guy's a warrior. So I'm going to promote him to the rank of captain within the Israeli army. And I'm going to put him over a thousand men. And so now you're promoted to captain. You and these men, you go out, you fight many battles, you're always winning, always saving Israel from their enemies. Now things get even better. You know, King Saul likes you so much, he gives you his daughter who just happens to be a princess. So you marry his daughter, and not only do you marry a princess, a real-life princess, not only do you marry her, but listen, listen, you, your best friend is King Saul's son. His name is Jonathan, and you're really close to him. You guys are wired the same. You have a kindred spirit. I mean, you guys, you're just best friends. Everything in your life is going great. There is nothing wrong in the world. Everything is perfect. And then one day, cracks begin to appear in the life that you're enjoying all too well. You're called in to play music for King Saul. And all of a sudden, he throws a spear at you. <laughs> not, with the, not with the intent of scaring you. With the intent of taking your life. And you have no idea why. Why'd you just throw a spear at me, man? You have no idea why. You're stripped from your position in the army, no longer a captain. Your relationship with your wife comes to an end. King Saul ends that relationship and gives your wife to another man. Oh, and, you know, because of your situation, you can never fellowship with your best friend, Jonathan, anymore. Before you know it, the king is bent on your destruction and you're forced to run, you're forced to hide, you're forced to live the life of a fugitive for, listen, the next 15 years. Wouldn't you call that an extended trial? And uh, during this time, you carry yourself, you carry yourself well, you do okay for the most part. You pray for deliverance, you seek God's um, um, uh, direction for your life, and you believe that someday, and you hold on to this promise with everything you have, you believe that one day God's promise for your life is going to come, through, uh, come, come true. You will be the next chosen and anointed king of Israel. And, 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 and this belief is expressed by many Psalms that you've written in the midst of this difficulty. But listen, it's been a long 15 years. You're tired of the life of a fugitive. You're tired of always running. You're tired of always hiding. You're tired of always looking over your shoulder. It's been a long 15 years. And so you wake up one morning and there's something different in your heart. There's something different going through your mind. And um, you entertain the thought that Maybe God has forgotten me. I mean, it's been 15 years. Maybe his promises are not true after all. Maybe my enemies, maybe they will prevail over me. 
the more you think about these things, the more you believe them to be true. And it's not long before you're discouraged and you're dismayed and you find yourself trapped in the pit of hopelessness and despair. And while you're in this, uh, uh, this situation, you make a foolish decision. And you make this decision right here. You make a decision that alters the course of your life. You decide to give up on God. You decide to give up on God's plan. You decide to give up on God's promises for your life. Well, my friends, this is where we find David here in chapter 27. After 15 long years of living as a fugitive on the run, David has found himself in a place where he's defeated, he's discouraged, and he's depressed. And this is what you're going to see in chapter 27. In the midst of this extended trial, David he decides to give up on God's plan for his life. He comes to the conclusion that God must have forgotten about him and that, and that God's plan for his life has failed or, or wasn't true to begin with. And so David, he takes his life into his own hands and he begins living for himself. Oh, my friends. As we study through this chapter today, chapter 27, and then briefly into chapter 28, I, I, I want you to see what happens to a person's life when they choose not to stay close to God. Because let me tell you something, the person that chooses not to stay close to God will always live a life of unrighteousness, and they will always compromise the faith. And this is what you're going to see this morning. With this in mind, come now to verse 1 where we're going to begin to see this unfortunate event in David's life unfold. And David said in his heart, verse 1, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul would despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. Isn't it interesting how verse 1 begins? Notice the first couple of words. We're told that David said in his heart. My friends, we're not told that David prayed. We're not told that David sought the Lord. All we're told in the scripture here is that David said in his heart. Make sure you understand something. What you say in your heart has tremendous power over your thinking and over your actions. For example, if someone says in their heart, God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. Well, is that going to affect their thinking and their actions? Yeah, definitely. Now flip that around and the same principle applies. If, God, if someone says in their heart, God does love me. He does love me and I know it. Is that going to affect their thinking and their actions? Yes, of course it will. Again, what you say in your heart has tremendous power over your thinking and over your actions. Now, what is it exactly that David said in his heart? Notice first he says, I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. The pressure of constantly running from place to place as a fugitive, as a wilderness exile, always one step ahead of capture, always one step ahead of death, is finally caught up to David. That pressure, he just gives into it. When David says these words, I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul, it's as if he's admitting that he has lost complete sight of the fact that God has chosen him and anointed him to be the next king of Israel. Would, 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 would God really do this in David's life? I thought about it this week as I was studying. And, and I had to ask myself a, a very logical question that deserves an answer. If, if, if God is for David, would he allow anything to happen to David? If God has promised David over and over and over again through so many different people, if he has promised David, you will be the next chosen and anointed king over Israel, do you think that God would allow him to be killed before he actually reigned as king? Not at all. That's not how God works. But David thinks otherwise. David has convinced himself that he's going to perish someday by the hand of King Saul. Now look at what else he says there in verse 1. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. Did you catch this? David says, there's nothing, um, uh, there's nothing better for me. Or in other words, what he's saying is, 
The best thing that I can do in my current situation, the best thing that I can do is to escape over to the land of the Philistines. Can you believe this? David is actually telling himself to leave the land of Israel, the land that was promised to Israel or the Israelites, right? The promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, right? He, he's convinced himself to leave that land, to leave God's people, to go and to live among Israel's greatest enemy, the Philistines. He's convinced himself of that. Can I tell you what I find interesting about all this? And I'm just reading into the text a little bit here, just, just to make a point. But I'm, I'm fairly convinced that I'm right about this. What do you think David would have said if King Saul came to him personally and, and said, Hey, David, look, I want to have a conversation with you about something. What do you think David would have said if King Saul said this to him? David, I want you to pack your stuff up and I want you to leave the land of Israel, never to come back. I'm going to tell you what David would have said. David would say, leave the land of Israel? The promised land? Leave it? No. Leave, leave God's people? No. Saul, you're crazy. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere, Saul. This is my land, my people. I'm staying. That's what David would have said to Saul if Saul would have personally asked him to leave. David would never let Saul drive him out of the land of Israel. But isn't it interesting? He'll let discouragement do it. He'll let discouragement drive him out of the land of Israel. He'll let discouragement drive him far away from God and far away from God's will for his life. I, I, I got to tell you guys, you, you know this. I'm remind, reminding you what you already know. You don't need a three-point sermon on this. Discouragement is a powerful tool in the hand of the enemy. So here's David. He's found himself in a place of extreme discouragement and in communion with his own heart. Instead of talking with God, um, David has reached a point where he's convinced that God's plan and promise for his life has failed. Well, there's nothing God has left for me. His promises has failed, so I'm just going to go do what I want to do. I'm going to go live for myself. So with this, David does the absolute worst thing that he could do. He walks away from God, and he walks away from God's will for his life. Look at it there in verses 2 through 4. Then David arose and went over with 600 men um, uh, who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives. His two wives are listed there in verse 3 and in verse 4. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. So there goes David, by, out of the land of Israel and into the land of the Philistines. Now keep in mind, over the 15 years that David has been living as a fugitive, a wilderness exile, Many people were drawn to him as a leader. And at this point in his life, David has 600 men following him. And then those 600 men have their families with them. So they, there's a, a lot of people following David right now. And, and notice David's decision to leave the land of Israel didn't just affect him, but it affected the 600 other men and their families as well. My friends, we would call this a foolish decision, wouldn't we? Any decision that is made without seeking the Lord, without praying, any decision that is just acted upon rashly and just, and just made without any thought, without filtering it through the Word, man, that is a foolish decision. And I'm going to tell you something, foolish decisions always does this. Foolish decisions has a way of not only affecting ourselves, but affecting other people around us as well. So here's David walking in complete disobedience against God. He leaves the land of Israel and he goes into the land of the Philistines. Where exactly does he go? Well, understand that the land of the Philistines uh, was divided into five, uh, five different regions. And each region had a regional king and each region had a regional capital. Um, if you want to know the capitals of the, the regions, it would be Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, Gaza, and Gath. That's the five capital cities within the five regions 
with five regional kings. And that's how the Philistine territory was split up. Well, we're told here that David comes to the capital city called Gath, and he meets with the regional king of that region, of that city called King Achish. Now, there's no doubt the news of Saul trying to kill David has reached the Philistines. Um, I'm convinced of this. David was a very popular man, not only among his own people, but among the enemies of Israel. Everybody knew who, da- who David was. And when David wasn't showing up for battle, and you because know, they had several battles between the Philistines and the Israelites, nobody saw David the warrior out there. They started asking all these questions. The enemies, man, what happened to David? Did he get killed somewhere? What, you know? And, and somehow the, the, the enemies of Israel find out that David is now living the life of a fugitive in the wilderness from King Saul. And, and, and the, the, the mindset of that would be in the eyes of the Philistines, he was an enemy of Saul. And any enemy of Saul would certainly be welcome in the Philistine territory. And so we know that David and his men stayed there in Gath, at least for a short time. Verse 3 tells us, So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household. But after a time of living in Gath, David comes to King Achish, this Philistine king, and he has a request. This is the request, verses 5 through 7. Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now, the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. So, so, so make sure you understand. After some time of living in Gath, David comes to the king of Kish, this Philistine king, and, and this is what he says. He just says, hey, look, man, I got a request. My request is this. Would you give me and my people a place to stay out of the capital? We don't want to stay in the royal city. But is there a place out in the country somewhere that we could stay, that, that you'd be willing to give us? Notice the exact word David used in his request. First, he says to King Achish, <clears throat> if I have now found favor in your eyes. You understand that statement? If I have now found favor in your eyes. My friends, this does not sound like the David we all know and admire. This doesn't sound like the David that little kids read about and aspire to be like, right? When has David ever cared about finding favor in the eyes of the Philistines? Seriously, this is a Philistine king. He is, make sure there's no mistake about it, he is an enemy of Israel. And not only is he an enemy of Israel, but he hates Israel defies the living God. And here's David busying himself about finding favor in his eyes. Um, Isn't it true, oftentimes we are too concerned about finding favor in the eyes of the world and the ungodly. I've seen so many Christians fall into that trap. I know too many Christians who busy themselves with trying to find favor Um, in the sight of the ungodly, in the sight of the world, my friends, let me tell you what the result is every single time. Across the board, the result is a compromise to the faith. Every time you see a Christian trying and busying themselves with trying to um, um, find favor with the world, they end up compromising the faith. My friends, God doesn't ask us to find favor in the sight of our enemy. He tells us to love our enemy. He tells us several things, you know, to do with our enemy. Love them, all these things. But he never asked us to find favor in the sight of our enemy. But this is where we find David trying to find favor with an ungodly Philistine king. Notice what else David says there in his request. Verse 5, Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. And listen to this. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Did you catch that? David, what? I mean, it's like every statement David makes, 
It's like he's just digging the hole deeper and deeper. David acknowledges himself as a servant to the Philistine king. He's really setting himself up for disaster. Because listen, when, 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 it'd be one thing to be living in the land of the Philistines and just say, hey, look, you know, can I just live over here and just let us do our thing and you, know, you guys do your thing. We, we just want to get away from King Saul and stuff like that. That's one thing. But to sit down and look at the king of Kish in his eyes and say, I'm your servant. That's a whole nother thing. David, I don't know if he realized it or not, but by acknowledging himself as a servant of the king, King Achish could have easily required David to bow down and to worship and sacrifice to their pagan gods. He could have easily done it. He could have easily said, you need, you, you, you need to give up your faith, you need, you need to stop believing in the living God, and you need to believe in our pagan gods. He could have easily said that. At any rate, King Achish quickly accepts the idea, more than likely he's happy to get rid of all these 600 men and their families out of his capital city. I mean, they got to be straining the food and water supply. Um, so he gives David a city called Ziklag. It's situated 25 miles southeast of Gath, of the capital city where King Achish is. And notice from David's request, he says, give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. When you read these words in the original context or in the original language, you understand that David has no intention of ever going back to Israel. His plan now is to give up on God, give up on God's plan and promises for his life, and now to dwell for the rest of his life in Philistine territory. That's David's plan. That's what he wants to do. Are you beginning to see how David's decisions are causing him to walk further and further away from the Lord? Listen, first he walks away from the promises that God has for his life. And then the next thing he does, he leaves the land of Israel. He leaves the, 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 the people of Israel for a land filled with ungodly people and people who just, or just do not believe in his God. After this, he comes to the land of the Philistines and tries to find favor in their eyes. And then we understand now that he has no plan of ever going back to Israel. David, we would say, is at a very low spot in his life. And can it get any worse for David? You know it can. This is the Bible we're studying and reading. It can get worse for David. Look at verses 8 and 9. And David and his men went up and raided uh, these people groups here. It's listed for these, or excuse me, for those nations where the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to shore, even as far as the land of Egypt, whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but he took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. So listen, here's David and his men, and they're given the city of Ziklag, to live in, but now they need a means of livelihood. And remember, where they're now situated in Ziklag, they're 25 miles southeast of where King Achish lives. And so they need a means of livelihood. So what do they do? Well, they became bandits and raided the inhabitants of the land. This is what they decided to do. David would gather his men together, they would make a decision. Hey, we went you know, we went east the other day. Let's go west today. They would find some village, massacre the people, and then take all that they had. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me show you something interesting in verse 8. Verse 8 says, and David and his men went up and raided. See that word raid or raided? That word in the Hebrew, it carries the idea of stripping the dead of their loot. That's intense stripping the dead of their loot. Just let it sink in for a moment. Just think about it with me. Here's David, the man after God's own heart. That's how he is described in, in, in the Bible. The hero of Israel, the great musician, the writer, the poet, whatever you want to say of so many of our songs. He's now making a living by killing men and women and taking their possessions. That's David right now. Now make sure you understand, periodically, King Achish would check in on David to see what he's been up to. Again, it's a 25-mile trip one way. 
And so it wouldn't be often, but periodically, King Achish would come down to Ziklag and just say, hey, David, what have you been up to? So this is where we find ourselves now with verses 10 and 12. King Achish makes his way down to Ziklag, and then they have a conversation. Verse 10, then Achish would say, where have you made a raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, unless they should inform on us, saying, thus David did, and thus was his behavior all the time that he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. And so Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him, therefore he will be my servant forever. Now make sure you understand, King Achish knew that David was making a living by raiding villages. He didn't have a problem with that whatsoever. He knew that's what David was doing. He was just misinformed on who David was actually raiding. Um, King Achish would ask David, hey, David, where have you made a raid today? And David would say, what was his answer? We're told right here. He would say, I've been raiding in the southern area of Judah. You guys do understand. Judah is in the southern part of Israel. David wasn't raiding in, in, in Israel. Not at all. David is lying to and deceiving King Achish. He's making the king uh, think that he's raiding Israelite villages when in fact he's raiding villages that are allies with the Philistines. And oh man, and what was the reaction to King Achish to all this? He says there in verse 12, he has made his people of uh, Israel utterly abhor him, therefore he will be my servant forever. Remember, King Achish has been deceived. King Achish really believes that David is attacking his own people, that he's raiding his own people, and that he thinks this is just great. His thinking went like this. David is attacking his own people. He's going over into Israel, attacking villages, killing the people, taking their stuff, coming back. Man, when you know these Israelite people, they're going to hate David forever. He is going to stay in Phil, uh, uh, um, here among the, us in Philistine, and, and we, you know he's going to be my servant forever. That's the mindset of King Achish right now. So David has deceived King Achish, but his lives will catch up to him. Something is about to happen that David has not planned for. Look at it here. We'll begin to close with this. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 28. Now what happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, listen to this, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle you and your men. So David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore, I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. So you got to remember, the Philistines in Israel are great enemies, and they're always at war. We've already read in the first 27 chapters of our verse-by-verse -verse study in 1 Samuel, we've read several times that these guys have battled. Which seems that the Philistine commanders have gotten together, and they've decided that it's now time for another military campaign against Israel. So what does King Achish do? He orders David and his men to accompany the Philistine forces in battle against Israel. And Achish is thinking, I mean, logically, right? David's been conditioning him. David's been telling him, hey, I've been killing Israelites the whole time I've been here. And so King Achish says, hey, he's not going to have a problem with it. He's thinking that, you know, David, you know, he's not going to have a problem with going over there and being with, on our side in war and killing more Israelites, Right. He's been conditioned by David's lies to think this way. And uh, I really like what Chuck Smith said about this. He said, what a mess we weave when we choose to deceive. Isn't that true? What a mess we weave when we choose to deceive. You know, David's in a spot, a tough spot here, man, because he can't just say no. He can't say no. And so he just kind of gives this sort of a bland response when King Achish says, hey, you're going with me to battle against the Israelites. He just says, surely you know what your servant can do. I mean, we really don't even know what that means, David. Yeah, we know what you can do. That's why the Philistines want you to go kill some Israelites. But I mean, you know, it's sort of a bland response. And then if it could get worse for David, it does. King Achish looks at him and says, 
Therefore, I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Now David is going to be working as a bodyguard for King Achish. <laughs> Everywhere King Achish goes, David's got to go. Everything King Achish commands him to do, he's got to do it. What a mess David has got, him in, got himself into by choosing not to stay close to God, but rather walking away from God, walking away from God's promises and plans for his life, and then just choosing to decide, you know what, I'm going to live my own life the way I want to live it. Well, the situation just keeps going from bad to worse, and David gets in so deep that it doesn't look like there's a way out. Now, we're going to stop there, and we're going to pick back up. But it's going to be two weeks before we pick up in this study, because let me tell you why. We're in chapter 27 today. Next Sunday, we'll be in chapter 28. And in chapter 28, we have what I would consider one of the most bizarre passages in the entire Bible. Trust me, it's bizarre, and you don't want to miss out on it. But it has nothing to do with what's going on here. And then when we get done with chapter 28... We go to chapter 29, and then in chapter 29, we come back to this story with David and King Achish and the Philistines going out to war with Israel. So you got to wait till chapter 9 to pick up in this study, but don't skip out next Sunday because we're going to take on a very bizarre passage in the scriptures. Go ahead and read through it, chapter 28. It's crazy but we're going to make our way through it. But as we begin to conclude our time together this morning, allow me just to very quickly share with you two lessons from this passage, two lessons that I believe are just overarching and, 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 and lessons that we need to learn from this passage. First lesson is this. Never converse, con, never converse with your difficulties alone. That's the first lesson. You know, through the difficulties David faced, he fell into what we would call solitary syndrome. Or in other words, David became convinced that he was all alone in his struggles. You guys have studied 1 Samuel, at least up to this point. Was David alone in his struggles? Not at all. God had put several people into his life at different periods in his life where he was never alone. He had the prophet Samuel for a while. He had Abiathar, the priest, for a while. He had Jonathan, who constantly stood by his side, always reminding him of God's promises. He's now married a woman by the name of Abigail, who is a great encouragement to him. David's not alone. And even if you take all of those people out of David's life, listen, he still has God. God hasn't abandoned him. God hasn't forsaken him. He still has God. My friends, David wasn't alone, but he has convinced himself, and it all started when he started conversing with his own heart. He's convinced himself that he is alone, and he starts making decisions that affects him and 600 men and their families. My friends, make sure you understand, whenever you begin to think that you're alone in your spiritual struggles, you are deceived and you're ripe for spiritual failure. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I know for me, I've been in the midst of, you know, struggles. I've been in the midst of extended periods of trials before. And you may find yourself in a position this morning where you're in just an extended trial. You may be entertaining the thoughts Man, there's no hope. There's, 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 there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You may even have reached the point that David reached, and you're waking up in the morning, and you're saying stuff like this. You're saying, you know, God has just absolutely forgotten me. God's promise, his plans for my life, they're nothing. I'm just going to walk away from God. I'm going to do my own thing. My friends, what, what you're saying is that you're alone, and what you're doing is you're conversing with your difficulties alone. And I want you to know something, and please hear me when I say this. I can name right now, if you wanted me to name them, I could. I could name right now from this pulpit 10 people in this church who would 
gladly walk with you through any struggle that you may be facing. People who would pray with you, people who would encourage you in the promises of God, people who would um, love on you, people you could confide in. I can name 10 people right now. But even if we remove all those people, you're still not alone because you have God. God hasn't forsaken you. He hasn't abandoned you. God hasn't, and he, nor would he leave you just to say, you know what, I'm going to abandon this person in the midst of their difficulty, in the midst of their spiritual struggle, and I'm just going to say to them, you guys figure it out. That's not the God we serve. God doesn't abandon us and forsake us in the midst of those things. The Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is a very present help in times of trouble. That's the God we serve. That's the God of the Bible. Listen, my friends, God is always on your side, always ready to listen, always a very present help in times of trouble, Never converse with your difficulties alone, especially when you have unlimited access to the God in heaven who loves you and has a perfect plan for your life. Now, lastly, second lesson, and we'll close with this. Stay in fellowship with God and stay among God's people. I think it's a valuable lesson we should learn. Um... Listen to this statement. I wrote this down in my notes because I really wanted to get it right and share it with you. There is no meaningful thing happening in this world that is worth leaving the fellowship of God and leaving the fellowship of God's people for. You understand? As I think about this this stage of life that David has found himself in. I I see in him a portrait of many believers I've met over the years. David pictures people who have been saved by grace and they begin their walk very well with the Lord, but somewhere along the way, things don't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. They don't go as they envisioned. They become defeated and disillusioned and discouraged. You know, I I know people, and I'm not saying this happens to every single person, but I know people who became a Christian thinking that all their bills were going to get paid. I know people who became a Christian because they thought that, you know, if I become a Christian, God's going to allow me to, you know, have some nice possessions. All these things. And then after they become a Christian, maybe it was a true conversion, maybe it was not, but let's just say it was a true conversion. After they become a Christian, you know, things don't work out the way they think it's going to work out, and they end up walking away from the Lord. They say, you know what, I just, you know, I just, I just can't do this. I thought that this is the way it was going to be, and it's not this way, and so I'm just going to give up on God and His plan, His will, His promises, and I'm just going to go live for myself. And in their weakened spiritual condition, they make a terrible decision that had terrible consequences in their lives. Instead instead of staying close to God and following His will for their lives, they chose to walk away from God and to walk away from God's will and His plan and His purposes for their life. Listen, my friends, I can't stress it enough. I can't stress it enough. There is no meaningful thing happening in this world that is worth leaving the fellowship of God and leaving the fellowship of God's people for. There is only one meaningful thing happening in this world. You want to know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. The only meaningful thing happening in this world is what God is doing through his people. That is it. That's it. What God is doing through his people, those people who decide, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord, I'm going to be obedient to his plan and his purpose and his promises for my life, I'm going to walk in a way that's righteous, walk in a way that's pleasing to him. That is the only meaningful thing that's happening in this world, what God is doing through those people, through what we would call the church. That's it. And there's nothing in this world worth leaving the fellowship of God and the fellowship of God's people for. So my friends, if you have found your place today in that position, 
If you have found yourself today in a place where you just want to give up, that there's no hope, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, I want to tell you and I want to encourage you because I hope you find peace. There is hope and there is encouragement. My friends, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I want to encourage you with that and I want to pray for you. Father God, we come to you now. And we want to give a chance to respond to this message, Lord. Many of us today have found ourselves, if we were to be honest, in the midst of an extended trial, extended difficulty. And many of us, Lord, we're, 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 we're on the brink of giving in like David did. We're on the brink of just saying, Lord, I'm done. I can't do it any longer, Lord. Lord, would you speak to our hearts this morning? Would you do a work in our lives this morning, Lord? You know, if, that's, if that is you, if you're on the brink of just giving in because of an extended trial, listen, our, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm, I'm the only one that can see you this morning. I, I just want to ask that you would raise your hand so I can see it. I just want to pray for you. Is there anybody in here like that? Amen, I see you. Anybody else? Mm hmm. Yep. Anybody else? Amen. I have several people. Man, Lord, you know what these people are going through, you know the extended trial that they're facing. And I'm just asking, Lord, that you would bring hope into their life and encouragement into their life. And I'm just praying that you would empower them by way of your spirit, Lord, to not give in to discouragement and despair and, 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 and hopelessness. I'm praying, Lord God, that you would strengthen them, strengthen them in their faith, strengthen their hearts and their minds. Lord, would you do a good work in their life? And we do pray for the extended trial that, Lord, maybe if it's your will, that it would come to an end soon. But no matter what, Lord, no matter how long you desire it to go on, just pray over my brothers, my sisters, those of you who are watching online as well. Just pray that you would give us the strength to endure it, Lord. And that when it's all said and done, that you would be able to look at us with joy with gladness and say that they didn't compromise. They didn't give in. Father, would you strengthen us to be able to do that? Do that good work in our life, Lord. We love you. We love your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.